You know, it's said that for humans, uh, adult humans, that we make on average 35,000 decisions every day. Not in a year, but every day that we make an average of 35,000 decisions. Well, I just wanna let you know, you made the best decision by being in the house this morning, amen? And for those of you who are joining us online, you made a great decision as well. You know, 35,000 decisions is a lot of decisions that I believe. That's 12.7 million decisions that we make every year. From the age of 20 to 40, you will make 235 million decisions. That's a lot of decisions. Cornell University actually says that on a daily basis that you and I make an average of 226.7 decisions just on food alone. Now, I don't know. I mean, I think about food a lot. Some of you are probably really thinking about food right now. And uh, we're just gonna ask you to kind of keep those down for a moment. Let's make a decision to allow the Lord to feed us spiritually. Then we'll go feed the body, all right? And so there's just lots of decisions that we make. But here's what I would say. And probably many of you would say this as well, with all of the vast amount of decisions that we make on a daily basis, that if we were to narrow our life down, we were to summarize our life, that on average, there are probably 10 to 12 major decisions that we have made that have charted the course of our lives. Perhaps even four or five. In history, I was just looking up this week, big moments in history. Many of us know, and I would consider this to be one of the greatest speeches of all time, Dr. Martin Luther King's speech, I Have a Dream. What we don't know is that that famous speech spoken in August of 1963 in front of the Lincoln Memorial was not the speech that Dr. King had prepared. In fact, Dr. King, for the previous eight months, had spoken multiple times about this idea and this illustration of dreams And so his writers and those who were close to him said, you know, Dr. King, uh, maybe we're getting a little worn out on this and maybe we don't need to mention dreams in this particular speech. So in his speech for that day, he had excluded the word dream until he approached the podium and someone yelled from the crowd that said, tell him about the dream, Martin, tell him about the dream. To which Dr. Martin Luther King came off of his prepared speech and spoke from his heart and that speech has spoke and inspired more people than any other speech perhaps throughout our lifetimes. Not only that, but we have the Titanic. Most of us are familiar with the Titanic, but did you know that the last day just before the Titanic was to set sail this unsinkable ship, indestructible ship, that there was a change to the crew members that day and the second in command, the second captain, was taken off of the staff schedule and was replaced. But it was such a last minute decision that he forgot, the second captain, David Blair, forgot to give them a key to one of the lockers. And it just so happened that the key of that locker, that opened that locker, which contained binoculars, could have very well been the one thing that prevented them from sinking the ship. And so it's big things in life oftentimes come down to significant decisions that may not seem significant in the moment. This morning, we're gonna look at the life of Moses. As you've followed with us throughout this series, The Ripple Effect, we've worked through for the last couple of months this passage in Hebrews chapter 11. And just for those of you who are stepping in new to us, uh, this year, we're looking at these three topics, faith, hope, and love. And right now, we're focusing on the word uh, faith throughout scripture and looking at Hebrews chapter 11 as kind of our roadmap. And Pastor opened that first week and he said this. He says, present choices affect future consequences. And we know that to be true. It sets ripple effects in our lives, both positively and negatively. And so today, some of the decisions that some of us perhaps may make may be the ones that set positive ripples into not just our generation, but into another generation. And in Hebrews chapter 11, what we're finding is, is that the writer has written and he has highlighted men and women who are strong in their faith. And again, as I said last week, you have Joseph's whole life, 13 chapters out of the book of Genesis, narrowed down to one single verse. And today we're gonna have five books that Moses wrote. Moses himself wrote Genesis through Deut- Deuteronomy. And the only thing he didn't write of those five books was just the closing lines that outlined his death. And yet, the writer of Hebrews narrows it down to just a few verses in this chapter. 
And he kind of highlights them with this word by faith. And we've seen that word by faith lots throughout this series. And what that word, what the writer is really trying to accomplish in this passage is he's writing a letter to a group of believers who are Jewish in their background. And they're at a place where their faith is faltering because what they know about God and what they know about church is a matter of doing religious things. It's a matter of obeying the laws. Their righteousness was based upon how well they obeyed. And what they could not grasp was that faith in Jesus alone was enough to sustain them. And so they were kind of going back to their old ways because that's what they knew of God was the things that they would do through according to the law. And so what the writer does, specifically with Moses, is Moses was the one who received the law from God himself. And so the writer, interestingly enough, spends some time on Moses and he says of Moses, not all of the things of the law, but he marks these key moments in Moses' life that begin with this phrase, by faith. Not by law, not by the things that we do, but by faith, Moses marked his life with these key things. And as we open up the scriptures today, I pray that God would open up our hearts to receive them. Would you pray that with me for just a moment? Father, we pray according to Psalms 119, verse 18, asking, Lord, that you would open the eyes of our hearts. Lord, would you open the eyes of the things that we would see to comprehend and to understand the words of your law? God, I pray, Lord, that you would allow us to see something that we've never seen from Scripture before. I pray, Father, for some who need to make decisions, and this is a pivotal decision point in their life. I ask, Jesus, that you would guide them through this process by faith that they would make today some decisions by faith that would lead to a fruitful and fulfilling life in you. But not just for their life, but may their life be a testimony to the coming generations. We give you thanks and praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. As you're turning to the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, let me just give you a reminder of where we left off last week. We left off with Joseph dying and Joseph's coffin there in Egypt and Joseph instructing them, giving them strict orders to take his body into the promised land when that would come. Now, at this moment in the life of the Israelites who were in Egypt, things were really going well. They were able to basically co-live, co-live, uh, live together and cohabitate there with the, the Egyptians and things were going well financially. And it kind of seemed odd for Joseph to make this, this declaration of the Lord coming back to and bringing them out of Egypt into back into the promised land. And so as a part of uh, speaking something that they couldn't see now, but would come to fruition. As we open up the book of Exodus in the first chapter, what we discover is, is that the Pharaoh that was in place when, when uh, Joseph passes away, passes on and another generation comes on. And the Bible says that that generation, those Pharaohs did not remember Joseph. And their Israelites were proliferating, they were multiplying very quickly, and they, uh, the Egyptians were concerned and fearful that there were going to be so many Israelites that they were going to overtake the Egyptians just out of sheer numbers. And so Pharaoh created a law that said, and to the midwives who were uh, delivering the, the babies of those who were of Israelite or the Hebrews, that whenever the male was born, that they were to kill the male baby. The midwives saw favor with the Israelites and they began to hide some of the babies back. So Pharaoh took it another step and he says, any Egyptian who sees a male Hebrew boy born is to throw them into the Nile. And what we find here is that in this story, in the beginning of Exodus, that a Levite man falls in love with a Levite woman and they have a Levite child. And as long as they could, They held this child in secrecy to prevent and to keep his life from being taken. And so we look here in Hebrews chapter 11 at our first by faith in verse 23, and it says this. By faith, Moses, when he was born for three months by his parents, because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. So we begin this first one, and I want to give you this decision point, this pivotal moment in Moses' life and that will also become a pivotal moment in our lives at different points, and that's this. By faith, we must decide when to hold on and when to let go. 
There's gonna be some moments in your life, and especially just speaking to parents for a moment, there's gonna be some moments in your life when you're gonna have to hold on to your children. You gotta do everything that you can to keep and to protect them. There's also a moment in your life where you're gonna have to release them. Jochbed, Moses' mother, she did everything she could to preserve this young man's life. The Bible says in three different places that Moses was a beautiful child. And I don't think that that beautiful means that he was beautiful to look at as much as that Jochbed and her husband recognized that there was something in Moses' life that made him different. One commentator says that Moses was uncommon. And of course, we know now the, the backside of the story, the full story, as Paul Harvey would say. We know the rest of the story is that God uses Moses to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. And it was all in this mother who had to make a decision that by faith that she would hold on to protect and to preserve her child. We remember that Pharaoh's daughter came along in the Nile River and she found Moses in that reed basket hiding in the Nile. And that Moses' mother was able to take him back for a certain period of time to nurture him and to raise him up into the place of weaning. And then he would return back to Pharaoh's house as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, I can't imagine what it must have been like to know that your child in just a few short months or years was going to be taken to another place, to another culture, to another area where it would be in Pharaoh's house where they would not believe like you believed. That the Egyptians didn't believe in the same God that the Israelites believed in. Their culture was filled with sin and with pleasure and everything that they wanted. But here it is, this mother, she's, she understands the limited amount of time that she has to pour into this young man's life to be able to shape his identity as an Israelite, knowing that the culture was gonna throw everything it could against him to turn him away from the faith of which he was born into. Can you imagine for just a moment how intentional Jacques must have been? How intentional that every moment whenever she nursed that child and she held him, how she prayed over him because she knew her time with him was limited. That this coming down, the sitting down and the rising up and the going in and the going out, everything that she did was so intentional because she knew she had one shot at turning this young man's heart towards God. And the world was gonna throw everything it had against him. Can I tell you that you and I must be diligent We must be purposeful. We must be intentional about pouring our faith into our children. There's a reason why I believe Moses writes Deuteronomy 6. He only wrote from the history of what he knew of his mother, how she poured into him so that he would have a faith. Because one day, she knew she would have to let him go. There's some parents in this room right now that hold on for all that you can for the moment for which God has called you to hold on. But there's coming a moment when by faith, you're gonna have to release your child and understand that they are God's children and that God's able to keep them even in the midst of a culture that's not like yours. So we first must decide that we have to hold on and to let go. The second thing is found in in Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 24. Now again, understand this, that, that, that Moses would return to Pharaoh's house he would become the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And he comes to this place in his life where it's been 40 years have passed. And as a son of Pharaoh's daughter, they were in a culture in which everything was acceptable. The most sophisticated culture of that time. Riches galore, treasures galore. The things that they would have wanted was there. And Moses is at this place, and I believe God's dealing with the identity of who Moses is, and Moses is struggling in this process. And Moses one day sees an Israelite being beat up by an Egyptian. And in his desire to do good and to be good, I believe that that Moses steps out and he tries to defend the, the, the Israelite, and he winds up killing the Egyptian. The next day, two Israelites begin to fight. And Moses steps out and the one Israelite says, hey, I saw what you did yesterday. Are you gonna do that to one of us? And Moses is found out because I believe that this is the most pivotal moment in Moses' life. I believe it's the most pivotal moment in your life and in my life as well. 
And it's this moment when we have to make the choice of who's gonna be Lord of our lives. When we have to make the choice of which path we're going to pursue. Watch what happens here in verse 24. It says, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the temporary pleasures of sin. Considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, we must decide that future treasures are greater than present pleasures. Let me say that again. By faith, we must decide that future treasures are greater than our present pleasures. There's a moment in our culture, there's a moment in our lives where everything about this is just fun. It's pleasurable. The scripture says that sin is pleasurable for a season. It's enjoyable. But Moses was able to recognize that there was something about this moment that with all of the things that he could fill himself with and his soul with, he still wasn't satisfied. That there was a deeper yearning, there was a deeper longing, there was a deeper purpose within him that began to be birthed in this moment. And he couldn't really probably uh, put it into words, he couldn't describe it, but there comes to this moment where Moses says, I'm committing to turn down all of the things of Pharaoh's house, the pleasurable things, to pursue this life where I'm gonna be on the run, where I'm gonna be persecuted, they're gonna try and take my life, but I'm gonna embrace myself with my faith in Christ. It's interesting how Hebrews uses that word Christ in this moment. You see, I think of it like this. I think of it as the moment that Moses' faith became Moses' faith and not the faith of his mother. It's that moment when it becomes your faith and not the faith of Pastor Jared. It's the moment when your faith becomes your faith and not what Pastor talks about or what anyone else talks about. It's not what Pastor Caleb says. It's not Pastor Caleb's faith. It's your faith. It's this moment where you have an encounter with God that says, I'm going to go hard after God for everything. I'm all in for God regardless of the cost because I recognize that everything that this culture has to give me still pales in comparison to the treasures that are to come. You see, I I believe that Moses could have been in this place and was in this place where he could have felt protected by his identity as an Israelite and enjoyed the pleasures of the Egyptians. He could have been in that moment where he said, hey, I'm an Israelite, I'm protected. God says that he's gonna watch out for us and we're a chosen people and I'm an Egyptian which means that all of the things that you would consider to be sin are not sin to us. They're just a natural part of who we are. That's a part of our culture. That's exactly what the world says to us, that this is not wrong, it's just culture. And we could take this promise and this this, this step and this idea and this view that says, you know, it's just the world we live in and so we're just a part of it. But there's something deeper inside of each and every one of us that is calling us to step out and to rise and to live above for something greater and something different because we're called and we're chosen and we recognize this world is passing away and God is bringing us something to new. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, it says this. Peter writes and he says, but sanctify Christ as Lord of your hearts. Please listen to me. If you hear nothing else that I say this morning, please let this one point rest in your spirit forever. That you and I must come to a place in our heart and make a decision by faith that we are following the path of Christ and not the path of this world. That by faith, we must sanctify. That word means to set apart Christ as Lord. Meaning that we're not gonna have allegiance to two different places. Our allegiance is with God and his kingdom alone. Our allegiance is not as sons of Pharaoh's daughter. Our allegiance as children of God. This, to me, is the most pivotal moment in Moses' life. The Bible goes on to tell us in verse 27 here, it says, by faith, Moses left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he persevered as though, having seen, as though seeing him who is unseen. Now, here's the, the next step. I, I feel like our faith grows. 
I feel like there's this moment where we step into a place and we believe God and that's an initial step of faith, but I feel like there's another step where our faith goes even more so in, 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 the, in the way that we uh, follow after God and we believe God for things. And in this next moment, uh, read with me, it says, by, by faith we must decide to see the invisible rather than accepting the visible. At this moment in Moses' life, he had not seen God appear in the burning bush. This was prior to an experience where Moses would go into to the temple where he would meet with God and his face would come out glowing because he had these beautiful opportunities to see God. This was prior to all of that. So he had not seen God. But what he could see is that Pharaoh was trying to kill him. And yet he chose to believe the heart of God when he had not seen the face of God. There's some times in your life and in my life where we just have to take the principles of God's word because I don't have an example that would per- verbatim say in scripture, this is how I handle this situation. I haven't seen God come through in that way. But here's what I know. The heart of God says that he will keep me and protect me. I've watched with my parents, how my parents have overcome sickness and and have overcome things where by faith they believed God when they could not see him in the visible. When everything in what the natural realm and what they could see was, was speaking doom and gloom, I watched them hold on to God and I watched how God met them in that place. And your next dimension of faith is whenever you take God's promises and you stand on those promises, even when the evidence around about you doesn't seem to support what it is that you're believing in, but you know the heart of God. By faith, we must decide to see and to follow after the invisible rather than accepting what we see. The last one is this. The Bible says of Moses, by faith, By faith, Moses decided, and we must decide, to keep and obey God's word. You fast forward 40 years, Moses goes into the desert, he serves as a shepherd, he's kind of living his life there, he's almost 80 years old, and one day he's out, and remember, while he's out in the desert there, God appears to them in this burning bush and challenges him and calls him to go back to Pharaoh. And there comes this moment where Moses is called and all the people, we remember the 10 plagues. Some of us remember the Charlton Heston version. Some of us remember the finding, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, the, uh, Pharaoh was, was Prince of Egypt. The Prince of Egypt version from Disney. So whichever category you land on, whichever part you grew up with, uh, just remember, we remember the 10 plagues. And that the last plague was the plague of death. And that Moses was called by God. I love what it says in verse 28. It says, by faith, Moses kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch them. It's such a beautiful picture. It seems so contrary, but in that moment, that first Passover, as they painted, painted the blood on the doorposts of the home, by faith, Moses had to take God at his word that he was gonna protect them. By faith, they had to understand that the blood was enough. Interestingly enough, the writer of Hebrews is writing to the Hebrews and he's saying to them, by faith, you must understand that Jesus' blood is enough. You gotta obey his word. You gotta keep his word. By faith, sometimes, I don't understand everything that's in these pages. I don't understand how it's all gonna turn out except that God is faithful to his word and everything that he has spoken thus far has come to pass and I can only trust and believe that what is yet to come will come to pass in his time and in his way. Therefore, I keep his word by faith. Then we come to the last one. And this one is interesting to me. I miss this. Verse 29 says this. It says, by faith, Say this with me, they. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as though it's through dry land and the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. By faith, they. By faith, one man's decision became the testimony of many. 
An entire nation of people walked through the Red Sea that day because one man decided by faith that he would follow God. There's this book that I read in my first Bible class. The book was entitled, Will Our Children Have Faith? It was intriguing to me. I don't remember a single thing about that book other than the title. And the title has been so intriguing to me all my life. Will our children have faith? It's a question that I, as a parent, now ask. In fact, in my devotion and in my journaling this week, I wrote that very title. Because as a father, it's something that I want to be careful that my faith is passed down to my children. Not my religion, not that we come to church on Sunday, but that we have a miraculous working God who ministers in profound ways and he wants to reveal himself, not just to me and to my generation, but to their generation. Would you stand with me? I've since retitled that book. And the question I now ask myself is this, not will our children have faith or will my children have faith? The question I now ask is, will my faith have children? Will my faith be enough that one generation can see the decisions that we've made and how God has been faithful to his word? And will it be enough that they too will make that decision to follow? That the one decision led to the testimony of many. It was one mother who was unwilling to let go until she knew that she had done enough and she trusted God with the rest. There's some parents in this room that maybe you're at that crossroads right now in your life where you're leading your children. And for some of you, the call, the call and the act and of faith and the decision of faith today is to hold on a little longer. Be more intentional. Do more than you can. Don't give up on them. And others of you, you've got to stop hovering over them. You have to stop trying to do it for them, fix it for them. You have to release them and let them go and believe in a God who is able to sustain them and to keep them. Some of us in this room, or maybe those of you who are watching online, maybe today is that decision point like Moses had. Maybe you've been doing this church thing for a long time. Maybe you know all of the songs, but maybe today is your 40 years later when something has clicked in you and you're at a place where you're feeling God's calling you to something greater but you can't put your fingers on it, you can't describe it, you can't put words to it. But there's a place today that you recognize, I've gotta determine in my heart, is God God or is he not? Am I following after Jesus with all that I have? Am I going all in with Jesus? Or am I gonna try and play the fence? I pray today if there's anything again that you hear me say, that today is the day that you choose to set apart Christ as Lord of your life and believe that he is enough to keep you and to sustain you. Others of us may be in the room this morning and maybe where we are, where we are is a matter of trusting God for healing. Maybe it's a provisional thing. Maybe you've applied for all the jobs. Maybe you've turned down some jobs. You don't even know why, but maybe it's that step of faith today where you take it one step further. You say, by faith, I'm gonna choose and I'm gonna decide to go with what I can't see rather than being affected by what I can't see. In just a moment, our prayer team is gonna step out. We're gonna close with a song. And if you're at a place of decision this morning, you're at a place of decision one way or the other. 
Either you're gonna to decide to believe God a little bit more or you're gonna to decide to go the world's way a little bit more. But today you will make some sort of decision. It will be one of the 34,999 decisions because you've already chosen to be here. That's one. As we pray in just a moment, if you're at a place of a decision point, you need God to give you directions to step out. Maybe it's to surrender your life to Christ. Our prayer team will be down front and we'll pray together with you. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would stir my heart, that you would stir our hearts. Lord, that we would be challenged to step out by faith. Lord, that we would stop just walking through this life and doing this thing of church, but Lord, we would truly believe all that you've said in your word. God, if there would be someone in this room this morning or someone watching online who has not yet surrendered their heart to Jesus, they're feeling the desire to do something good, but it's more than doing something good. It's a matter of stepping out and trusting in Jesus that you are enough. The scripture says, Lord, all we have to do is to confess in our hearts that we need a savior. If we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so Lord, today, if someone needs to make that prayer, may this be the day that they choose to follow after Christ. God, I promise, you promise that you will never let them go. We will trust you in it, in Jesus' name. Let's close with this. Love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love one for another, even so come Lord Jesus. God bless you guys. Have a great week.